Dear Saikon audience, dear partners, dear allies, but above all, dear friends, the use of ICT technologies has made societies and organizations more connected. However, of course, it has also introduced new vulnerabilities and threats to public institutions, critical services and private entities. This April marked already the 10th anniversary of the cyber attacks that hit Estonia in 2007. In 2007, several private and public e-services faced malicious cyber operations, and these coordinated attacks focused the international community's attention on the severe risks posed by the increasing reliance of state and their populations on cyberspace. In retrospect, these were fairly mild and simple DDoS attacks, far less damaging than what has followed. Yet, it was the first time when one could apply the Clausewitz and dictum in cyberspace. War is the continuation of policy by other means. Ten years on, it is clear that the decision made by Estonia not to withdraw, but stay and fight for the security of our cyberspace was indeed the right one. We have high-functioning e-government infrastructure. We have reliable digital identity, a system of security measures that is obligatory for all government authorities, and a central system for monitoring, resolving, and reporting cybersecurity incidents. The most important element of protection is, of course, common understanding that protection can never be guaranteed technically, in system, on background. Finally, it always comes down to cyber hygiene of human beings. Also, we must understand that cyber attacks are something which is here to stay forever. But that it absolutely does not mean that honest societies must stay clear of benefiting from technological advances. Quite to the contrary, we must speed up offer of public goods through cyberspace, not to abandon the cyberspace to the bad guys. We do protect our street space. We never accept to withdraw and leave it to criminals. It should not be different for cyberspace. What threats do we face? What sorts of risks must be considered and how to protect ourselves better? 2016, that's the year what will be remembered for a number of unprecedented cyber incidents around the world. We saw one country attempt to influence the electoral process in another country. We saw how WannaCry exploited the fact that people do not update what they use therefore demonstrating we are not yet using even the protective gear what we already have. Most people, I'm afraid, act in cyberspace as recklessly as those driving on highways without seatbelts fastened. We saw how the Internet of Things was exploited to attack core services of the Internet, the effects of which transcended national and continental borders. The number of devices connected to the Internet is already many times larger than the number of devices we would traditionally call computers. The IoT has led to a new kind of risk that neither manufacturers nor users anticipated, and no specific cybersecurity requirements and standards exist for devices on the IoT. The whole sector has developed so rapidly that market regulators have not kept up with the development of the technology. And as a result, the approach to the threats from devices on the IoT has been reactive rather than preemptive. The focus is on minimizing and eliminating consequences of incidents. Large-scale DDoS attacks that rely on IoT devices are a potential threat to countries, as well as to the basic internet infrastructure itself. Frankly speaking, if I think of the nations which haven't done the digital change already, or who are not yet digital societies, as we here are, I really worry for all those nations, because, you know, we entered cybersphere a generation ago. Those people who are now going to vote first time this autumn over electronic voting system, if they so wish, 
they've grown up in the cyberspace, trying to jump into Internet of Things instead of when we made the transfer, when, well, occasionally you met the virus and then you downloaded Kaspersky or something and all the risks were covered. We need to be very vigilant in our digital action nowadays compared to those days. Vital services, they are increasingly cyber dependent. On the basis of worldwide events in 2016, the ever higher impact of cyber incidents could be seen mainly in the energy, healthcare, financial services and transport sectors. Two attacks on the energy system structures in Ukraine a year apart, they marked a sea change. A year ago, crippling of the energy system was considered an extraordinary occurrence. But in 2016, hazardous cyber vulnerabilities were a topic in very advanced, stable countries as well. Of course, not all attacks reflect the geopolitical interests of a specific country, but the established pattern is that tensions between countries also nowadays find their expression in the cyberspace. What to do? What measures are we thinking we can take here in E-Estonia? Information systems are an integral part of the Estonian state. Estonian laws already presume the existence of access to registers. Estonian state has a digital backbone that supports all the rest. All digital services here, they must function smoothly if state and society are to function in the manner that people are accustomed to. Thus, the digital state must be able to keep up with the changing expectations. People want their state to be digital, but also to be secure and up and running every day and every minute. I know they do. They ask me questions how horrible it was down for 15 minutes. Estonia proceeds from the principle of security by design. This general principle for development also pertains to updates developed due to technological advances. And it is all the time applied to the foundations of the Estonian digital society, such as solutions for the electronic identity used for authentication, which we call EID, and the state information systems data exchange layer, the X-Road. A trusted electronic identity, this is becoming more and more important in every digital society. It is extremely important that we know with certainty who is who in the electronic world, with whom we are talking to, who is on the other side. Estonia has been a trailblazer in the field of electronic identity and we have often been cited as a model worth following. We all know by now that authentication by password alone can no longer be considered secure. In Estonia, state systems and e-services that use ID card and mobile ID based systems are well secured by physical component and two passwords. Compared to the rest of the world, this obviously makes it extremely complicated and costly to access data from Estonia's government and bank services and reduces the attractiveness of these services as a target for criminals. Of course, when others catch up, the competitive advantage will ebb, and crooks will need also to try to crack these kind of systems. But right now, it gives best protection. Major global service providers such as Google, Facebook, and Microsoft have also successfully launched two-factor authentication systems, and its use rose significantly in 2016. This indicates that all developed states now absolutely must follow Estonia, Google, Facebook and Microsoft if they do not want to lose attention of their own citizens. Every citizen of any developed country is more and more attached to services offered by private sector over internet. And now I have a question. Why would you trust a state which is not able to release its citizens from visiting government offices? if every shopkeeper manages to release people from physically presenting themselves in the shops? I feel that is the question governments must ask themselves today, if they have not yet so done. In Europe, countries should be right now in the middle of implementation of what is called ADAS, 
regulate, regulation on electronic identification and trust services for electronic transactions in the internal market. By September 2018, EU member states are to accept each other's EIDs mutually. For this to happen, and thus for there to be more security for EU citizens and residents, EU countries have to pick up the pass in implementation of ADAS. That means start notifying their national EID schemes, for example. But we also actually need countries to take strong EIDs into use in the first place, still. Not everybody does. One more note on the two-factor authentication system. It is not the magic wand just by itself, of course. As the crypto algorithms go, as the underlying protocol of text message or phone call communications was just recently broken, countries like Estonia and the Googles and Facebooks and others, they always have to continue working to upgrade, upgrade the strength of factors themselves. All the challenges which we resolve technically or face and yet cannot resolve, obviously they also must have a legal solution. Tallinn Manual 2.0 is by far one of the most comprehensive analyses of international law applicable to cyber operations. For liberal democracies that respect the rule of law, international law undoubtedly shapes and bounds government's activities also in the cyberspace. International law definitely applies in cyberspace, making the life therefore simpler, but also maybe more complicated. At a time when the actions of unscrupulous states and violent extremist groups continue to threaten peace and security internationally, it is even more important that such actions are countered with a strong commitment to existing international law and the values that it represents. If we waver from that path of rule of law, we give the other side, the dark side, a good reason to do the same. We would not then be different ourselves. Therefore, rule of law must apply in cyberspace. Cyber operations have become an integral part of international relations. The recent laws launch of the Italian manual on the international law applicable to cyber operations is a practical handbook for state legal advisors of how to deal with these issues. Most of the latest incidents, they were interference by state actors or then we have suspected there have been interference by state actors. But they have definitely been below the threshold of using force as it is defined in the Charter of the United Nations. What they are, they are so-called peacetime operations. And that is the sphere where Tallinn Manual 2.0 has concentrated its efforts. No other initiative in the world carries so comprehensive overview of many different experts from various countries. It can now best be used by states trying to create their national positions on applying international law in cyberspace. The advisors to governments face the need to give legal opinion on different attacks and how they might be analyzed based on the law existing for the analog sphere. And I feel Tallinn Manual can be of great help in this task. As always, when we are discussing security, states must decide the threshold for their action. Where will be their red lines? We know that already defining these red lines would act as a cyber domain deterrent. It would also add to the transparency of the cyber domain if states were to define what their respective thresholds are in order to guarantee both internet security and at the same time freedom of use because we do not want to give up on our freedoms in cyberspace neither. As you know, Estonia will take over the EU Council presidency soon. Our presidency has a strong digital agenda. We must make sure we maintain cyberspace for the white powers and not abandon it to the dark forces. The future of the world will be digital. 
a prosperous and sustainable Europe embraces technological transformation by boldly seizing the opportunities offered by this trend. Yet, at the same time, rapid change and new technologies always create new vulnerabilities. This is also our task, to balance these risks and the benefits fairly. Technological innovation, of course, in itself is not the end game, but a tool that can make the lives of people, companies and governments much easier. This is why, for us, using smart IT solutions is a thread that runs through the entire presidency. The EU is a complex entity, and therefore we should use every opportunity to make its functioning more efficient and easier to understand. In the same way, the free movement of data is something that concerns all European policies and all fundamental freedoms. We need to find ways to ensure that the data is used in a secure way for our individual and collective benefit. 80% of EU citizens are now online. In this context, it seems pointless to ask why we should think and act digitally. Rather, it's a question of how to do it. We do not want to bore our friends and colleagues in Europe with stories of e-Estonia. But instead, we hope that our experience in this field can help and inspire. We recognize different societies face very different uh, challenges while going digital. With our experience, we can provide some answers and point to a few potential caveats where we ourselves had fallen into the hole. But we definitely must not and will not call on others to do exactly as we do. Because every state is also a culture. European Union is the union of different nation states. And that culture must be preserved while going digital, because people do expect it. Every digital state will be culturally different from any other digital state as well. E-residency, declaring taxes online in just five minutes or digital prescriptions, they aren't just nice things to present at conferences, but they are real-life solutions that benefit both people and the state. It means time saved and trees left growing. Anything digital is often thought of in the framework of economy and efficiency. Indeed, we do estimate we save 2% of our GDP by just signing digitally. But digital tools are also there when we want to speak to our families, look for a job, listen to music, or even operate the wheelchair. There are much more cultural aspects in digital than we thought 10 years ago. Our EU Council Presidency will focus on the establishment of a digital single market, increased use of e-solutions and data as well as on the development of cross-border e-services. We think Europe is ready for a change in gear, for creating a common, modern, accessible and secure electronic environment. An environment where people can shop online cross-border or interact with their government or another government in the European Union, or between themselves, with ease, without fear. And that is why progress on cybersecurity will be one of the pillars of our EU Council Presidency core program. We need to focus on facilitating the strategic discussions among member states on the road ahead, as we expect to have EU cybersecurity strategy on the table by autumn. We will work to make the NIS directive effectively work, for example, by leading the work of cooperation formats envisioned there. We will also lead discussions on the proper institutional setup on EU level, for example, by negotiations on the INISA mandate in Council. Last but not least, we will do concrete actions to boost the cyber resilience of Europe, like holding a tabletop exercise for defence ministers or compiling a guidebook on how to react to cyber incidents on EU level. That will be quite a program for six months. We also need to establish a European certification scheme, especially for staying safe in IoT world. Elaborating a European Union cybersecurity certification scheme avoids having to certify companies in each member state of the EU with different methods and evaluation criteria. 
But above all, no system standard or certificate will help us unless we can also teach people to take care of the hygiene aspects while online. Learning by doing. This has been so far acceptable, but the more dependent everyday life has become of internet-related services, the more cautious and conscious of the risks our people must be. And here I see the greatest field of cooperation between EU and NATO, the distribution of knowledge for civil society in less military terms than we use in cyber domain. Finally, my friends, allow me to say how much I appreciate the whole SICON team. SICON is unparalleled in its multidisciplinary approach in bringing together representatives from the government, military and industry to address legal, technology and strategy perspectives and to exchange ideas on the complex topic of cyber conflict. I hereby recognize the excellent work of the NATO CCDCOE in preparations for this event. Thank you all for making us all safer and offering an option which allows to embrace opportunities provided by technology, explaining people the risks linked to it, and through this global demystification effort, making sure both states and private actors feel they can trust in the cyberspace, no less than into analog sphere. Thank you all for this work ongoing into the future, which will help us all to live our lives effectively but also safe.